I have a crazy story for you guys. Just another disturbing Hollywood tale, but there's a lot of glitz and glamour into it, okay? So once upon a time in the glitzy world of Hollywood, there was an enchanting lady named Deborah Paget, born and bred in America. Deborah left her mark on the entertainment industry before disappearing from the limelight. Her fame soared sky high with her unforgettable roles in iconic movies like The Ten Commandments by the legendary Cecile B. DeMille and Love Me Tender where she shared the screen with the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. And who could forget her daring snake dance in the Indian tome? My favorite film of all time from her was definitely The Ten Commandments. I told you guys already I did a video for Anne Baxter, who starred in the film with her also. And I already told you guys how much I love that movie. I just love it. But comment below your favorite movie with Deborah. So this beautiful brunette was a sight for sore eyes during the 1950s. She had this unique charm that made her perfect for playing exotic characters. Think Native American princesses or South Sea maidens. However, beneath that glamorous exterior, she was often cast in rather predictable dramas and westerns. And despite her stunning looks and romantic aura, most of her roles were more about decoration than depth. And that made her very, very depressed. Deborah's career wasn't without its fair share of controversies. From the ages of 14 through 17, Deborah was playing the romantic interests of men 20 to 30 years older than her. The passionate on-screen kisses they shared didn't seem to bother anyone back then. And adding fuel to the fire, Deborah was often asked to play characters of different ethnicities by darkening her skin and eyes. Now, we can't put all the blame on her as she was, you know, bound by stiff contracts from the studios. She didn't have much of a say so. And her mother was, uh, you know, pushed her. Her parents basically pushed her into Hollywood. But it does make you think, doesn't it? The sweet heart shaped face girl with raven hair was turned into an object of exotic fascination by the studios. It wasn't long before Deborah grew tired of being the damsel in distress, lusted after by both grown men and teenagers, she yearned to play a feisty character like Marilyn Monroe in Niagara. Her discomfort grew when she realized how her image was being used by teenage boys during their coming of age phase. If you read between the lines as she got older, she realized these teenage boys were coming to her and telling her how much she was their crush and, you know, the stuff they would do to her images. <laughs> if you catch my drift, it made her very, very uncomfortable. Eventually, Deborah decided she had enough. She vanished from the limelight and almost overnight, it seemed, refusing interviews and making rare public appearances only for very special events and being on TBN, which is a Christian network. By the time she hit 30, she had already said goodbye to the chaotic world of Hollywood. Today, we will be breaking down her fascinating story, triumphs and setbacks. We will talk about also how once she turned Elvis' marriage proposal down, Elvis went and married Priscilla Presley, who almost looked identical to Deborah, right? Deborah even called this out, stating, and I quote, me, Elvis, and Priscilla look so much alike, we could have been triplets. We are going to get into it all and more and also do a beauty analysis for her. But first, hey friend, welcome to my channel, Queen Elude, where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars through history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so. And if you're already subscribed, please turn on your notification bell so you never miss an upload. Now, without further ado, let's get into this video. Let's start from the very beginning, which is her childhood. So once upon a time, on August 19th, 1933, a star was born in Denver, Colorado. Her name was Deborah Lee Griffin, but as she stepped into the world of glamour and glitz, she changed her name to Deborah Paget. Born and raised in a family that loved showbiz, they all moved to Los Angeles in the 1930s to be closer to the heart of the film industry, Hollywood. Her sisters, Tala Loring and Lisa Gay, also joined the family business and had quite successful careers in film and TV. Deborah, who dreamt of dancing since she was a little girl, was a post-depression baby. She was born during the Great Depression, a time when money was tight and times were tough. But despite their hardship, Deborah always spoke fondly of her family. In an interview with Dell Evans Rogers, she said, When I look back, we had so much love in our home. End quote. Deborah was one of five kids born to Margaret Allen, a former actress, and some even say an ex-burlesque queen, and Frank Henry Griffin, a painter. 
Deborah's favorite after dinner sport was wrestling. She said, we have five television sets at home because no two of us like the same program. When we do get together in the living room, I love to try out some new wrestling hold I've seen on my nearest victim, end quote. So there was a lot of playing in the house and her mom was a great cook. From a young age, Deborah and her siblings were pushed towards show business by their determined mother. And despite being surrounded by her talented sisters, Deborah once admitted to feeling like an ugly duckling. Religion played a big part in all three sisters' lives. Deborah once revealed in an interview, and I quote, I used to have a show on Trinity Broadcasting. I once did a seminar with Jacqueline White that was fun. We talked about the picture days. I do things for the Lord Jesus Christ. I give speeches. I write gospel songs and poems that are used when I speak, end quote. The young and talented Deborah never doubted her abilities. She landed her first professional job at just eight years old and soon after starred in a production of Shakespeare's The Merry Wives of Windsor. Her first big movie role was in Cry of the City, a 1948 film noir where she played the girlfriend of Richard Kant's character. She was 14 in that movie and well, <clears throat> let's just say he definitely could have been her father. Her very first close-up, her first screen kiss. Why is the studio, knowing her age, allowing her to kiss him? Why is my mother allowing this? We're engaged, aren't we? Richard Conti again, kissing a 15-year-old. Aren't there laws about that? But at the time, this didn't bother anyone and the film was received with rave reviews. Deborah's talent didn't go unnoticed by the big wigs and Fox. <laughs> they signed her to a long-term contract and she went on to have small roles in movies like Mother is a Freshman, It Happens Every Spring, and House of Strangers. Deborah signed her contract with 20th Century Fox when she was just 14 years old. She said in an interview, my mother was my agent. She had a lot of contacts and through her connections, I was signed. It kind of took your breath away at first. I was awestruck. It took a while to come down off that cloud. I had to have a parent and a school teacher with me at all times. Everyone seems to pick on the idea that mother accompanies me everywhere. Well, I'd like to explain that once and for all, my mother grew up in show business. She knows acting like most people do their own face. I like her to be on the set with me. It makes me feel assured that she's not only rooting for me, but is handy to point out some deeper meaning in a dramatic scene than is at first visible. Some stars have drama coaches or secretaries constantly with them. So what's so strange about mother being with me? After all, who would have my best interests more at heart than she? End quote. Side note, keep in mind that her mother was always with her according to her own words. So was her mother with her when she did some of these scenes where she was underage? We'll get into that. As to school and child stars, she said in an interview, and I quote, I attended the Fox school, which still had Shirley Temple's old school teacher. Mary Anders and Billy Gray were in school with me. I actually graduated from Hollywood Professional School, but by that time, I didn't know anybody, so I skipped the prom. Since you are at a studio school, every year you have to go downtown to take a test to make sure the studio wasn't cheating and you really were getting an education. Since I played older parts, my day might consist of doing love scenes, then doing math, then back to the love scenes. You had to have good concentration. They gave you four hours of schooling and four hours of working, and they didn't let you go one minute over. I missed a lot of magazine covers because of it end quote. Deborah's unique looks won her several roles in adventure dramas and she quickly earned a reputation as the only starlet who had never been kissed. In 1950s, she was even named the most beautiful legs in the world. When Deborah was barely 16 years old, she found herself in the successful movie Broken Arrow, working with the great James Stewart. In this film, she played a Native American maiden named Morningstar. The story was about her character falling in love with Stewart's character, who was 42 years old at the time. Yes, you heard that right, a 16-year-old girl with a 42-year-old man. Back then, no one seemed to bat an eye at this age difference, but if we look at it now, it does feel a bit weird, right? In fact, the movie even shows several scenes of Morningstar puberty rights, suggesting that her character might be as young as 13. Your life will be long. The good things will be yours. My God, I look so young and fresh. No wonder they... Oh. Just think about it. She was a kid, fresh out of childhood, and there was Miss Mr. Stewart, a mature man in his 40s, looking every bit his age. It's hard to understand how like audiences back then didn't find this age difference disturbing. And why would a grown man be attracted to a child? Even the movie plot was weird. Unfortunately, this aspect of the film veers into uncomfortable territory, okay? 
But let's not forget that Broken Arrow was also a progressive film for its time. It's a beautiful picture, okay? It portrays the Apache people not as brutal savages, but as human beings. That was a big step forward, and the film deserved praise for that. However, there were other controversies too. To play the role of Morningstar, Deborah had to wear dark contact lenses and darken her face with lots of makeup. She just looked muddy, and uh, it just was so obvious. She once said, and I quote, the contact lenses were a problem. They weren't like they are today, not plastic, but glass. They covered the entire eye, not just the eye irises they dyed the color in them the light would heat them up and they dried the eyeball i'd see rainbows for half an hour after taking them out as for working with james stewart she revealed that she was asked to lie about her age i was so young that i was told don't ever tell him your age lie and say you're 17. well i had a birthday on the set and when jimmy saw the number of candles he screamed oh my god i'm a dirty old man end quote she laughed after this comment and went on to say how much she loved him and it seems like deborah didn't see any Anything wrong with it either. After Broken Arrow, Fox gave Deborah top billing in the movie Princess of the Nile, where she co starred with Jeffrey Hunter. Sadly, the film didn't do well at the box office, but despite that, Deborah's popularity didn't fade. In fact, the fan mail she received at 20th Century Fox was only topped by the ones from Marilyn Monroe and Betty Grable. Now that's something. Deborah was borrowed by Paramount Pictures from her home studio, 20th Century Fox, to play the role of Lilia, the Water Girl, and Cecile B. DeMille's biblical epic, The Ten Commandments. This turned out to be the most successful film of her career, as well as her personal favorite film and mine also. But there was one challenge. Deborah had blue eyes and Lilia was supposed to have brown eyes. So again, she had to wear the contacts. She had to wear brown contact lenses to hide her natural eye color. Deborah once said, if it hadn't been for the lenses, I wouldn't have gotten that part. But she also admitted the lenses were awful to work in because the lights heated them up. But the success didn't stop there. In the same year, Deborah starred in a Fox Western, Love Me Tender, alongside none other than Elvis Presley. Despite Deborah and Richard Egan being billed above Presley, it was the singer's popularity and charisma that made the film a hit. Interestingly, Love Me Tender was not supposed to have any songs. Elvis didn't want to sing, but the producers wanted to cash in on his singing talent. So he ended up singing in the movie. In an interview, Deborah recalled, I was very shy, very quiet, and very immature for my age. I was in my very early 20s, but I was emotionally more like a 16-year-old. Elvis and I just sort of came together like a couple of children, really. The singer became obsessed with his co-star. He believed that Deborah was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen and even visited her parents' house. Following the film, he did ask me to marry him, she said, but my parents objected to my getting married. In the end, Deborah turned Elvis down. She had already fallen in love with Howard Hughes, a famous film producer and billionaire, and we'll get into that later. I cared about Elvis, but being one not to disobey my parents, that did not take place, she says. He was a precious, humble, lovely person. Elvis had a lot of talent. There was a lot of depth they never used. He could have been a fine actor, end quote. Deborah's last film for Fox was The Rivers edge. After that, her career started to fade. She moved to Paramount to play Cornell Wilde's love interest in Omar Khayyam. Despite her declining film career, Deborah, a talented dancer and singer, found success with a nightclub act at the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas. Her final two films were for Roger Corman at American International Pictures, Tales of Terror, and The Haunted Palace. In a later part of her life, Deborah became a born-again Christian. She hosted her own show, an interlude with Deborah Paget on the Trinity Broadcasting Network TBN, a Christian network in the early 1990s, and also was involved in Praise the Lord. Ugh, we all had to watch those growing up. She occasionally appears on TBN as a guest. In 1987, Deborah was honored with the Golden Boot Award by the Motion Picture and Television Fund, cementing her legacy in the world of film and television. She fondly recalled her years acting and all the wonderful places she got to visit, saying, I went to Hawaii for Bird of Paradise. I went to Acapulco, Mexico, all those places I saw in their virgin states, no hotel and people, end quote. Imagine that, being able to see those beautiful spots before they were swarmed with tourists full of you know, untouched natural beauty. What a dream. Fast forward to today and Deborah keeps herself busy with her religious activities. She's a strong believer in the power of good morals and values and she wishes that today's films would reflect those principles more. She's not a fan of today's films and the loose morals. 
You may have heard about Deborah's rumored romances with Howard Hughes. Let's talk about it. A well-known businessman, engineer, and film director, which I did a video for. I love that video. Like I said, check that video out. I'll pin it in the comments for you guys. Howard was just a very interesting man and he dated a lot of Hollywood stars. But she fell in love with Howard Hughes around the time of Elvis. And a lot of historians believe that this is why she turned down Elvis. She was waiting for Howard Hughes to really lock it in, right? And Elvis was so heartbroken. He went on to get with Priscilla Presley, who obviously looks a lot like Deborah, and he had a type ever since. Okay? She was pretty open about their relationship, saying, I was in love with Howard for two years, and I don't care who knows it. I was never alone with him in the whole two years. Mother was always with us. I haven't seen Howard for a long time now because I'm a one-man woman, and I've got to have a one-woman man. But I always remember Howard with fondness, end quote. So yes, there was something there, but it seems it wasn't meant to be because Howard wasn't going to be faithful. That's one thing about him. On the topic of love, Deborah has had her fair share of marriages and divorces. Her first husband was actor and singer David Street. They got married on January 14th, 1958, but unfortunately the marriage didn't last and they divorced on April 11th, 1958. Not long after, on March 27, 1960, Deborah tied the knot with Bud Boyticher, a film director. They got married in Tijuana, Mexico, but their relationship was short-lived. They separated just 22 days later and officially divorced in 1961. Then in 1964, Deborah married Lang C. Kung, a Chinese-American executive in the oil industry. Now, this guy had quite an interesting background. His parents were banker and politician H. H. Kung and businesswoman Sung I. Ling. Through his father, he was a direct descendant of Confucius, one of the most influential philosophers in human history. Deborah and Ling had a son together named Gregory Kung, but like her previous marriages, this one too ended in divorce in 1980. After her marriage to Ling, Deborah decided to step away from the limelight and let the entertainment industry for good. But despite the ups and downs, she left a lasting legacy in Hollywood and continues to be remembered for her contributions to film. It's crazy to say that she left and she was pretty, she expressed how sad and she was that she could never really, you know, just play the bad girl or characters that had more depth. She was always the princess locked in a tower, getting ready to be saved, the exotic roles. And she never got to really realize her passions of just being a real actress. And that really, really bothered her. But one thing that bothered her is her faith in acting like the sport of it. When she found out that, hey, there's consequences of some of the roles I took with young kids, am I encouraging lust and stuff like that? That's an interesting topic to see what you guys' thoughts are about this. I'm curious to see what your thoughts are about this. She didn't just see it as just art. She saw it as, okay, this is a major influence in a lot of people's lives. And here I am, these young impressionable boys, impressionable boys, they're using my photos and videos to do this. It really, really bothered her. She was not, she was not here for it. And she just was very turned off by that. And it takes a lot, you know, for someone to be in the industry to be turned off by that to where they say, I don't want to do this no more and actually stick through it. Because she wasn't, I think she was 26 or 27 when she left the industry, where she still had a good amount of years to keep going. You know, she could have kept going. She was still stunning, still her shape, everything. She could have kept going, but she just was over it. She was over it. Comment below your thoughts with that. That is very interesting, but I do feel like she was exploited in these films as a minor, having to lie about your age on set and all that. That was just too much. And if her mom was with her, that is weird. Okay, I do want to end this on a positive note and do the beauty segment for her because she aged really, really gracefully. Leave some flower emojis in the comments for Deborah because she... I do sympathize with her before you're like, oh, she technically was appropriating. Yeah, I have to remember, like I state in all of these videos that these stars were under very tough contracts. They did not have a say-so. I've seen my Kim Novak video. She had no say-so even over the color of her hair. Like whatever role you don't want to do, you can get sued. You can get dropped. Like they can blackmail you. Like she had no say-so. She didn't like playing these characters either. That's why she was so dis depressed by it. They just told you where you fit in. And because she had this exotic face, eyes, and hair, and stuff like that, they, although she was just all American, they still put her in these positions to play these ethnic people. But I really don't think she really had much say so. And if you have a mom who's a stage mom, essentially, who's determined to make you famous, they're going to take whatever role is going to get you there. And I feel like I don't.
don't know much about her mom, but you know, the fact that they even moved closer to Hollywood, she was with her, everything like she, 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 she probably wasn't, wasn't really too tough with the studios, whatever the studio said, you know, she probably was kind of getting along with it. I don't know. That's my speculation though. Don't give Deborah Paget any hate or any of these stars from back then much hate because they didn't get into the industry already knowing what it would come with. A lot of them had a rude awakening and were very shocked with how dark it was behind the scenes. And that's why they got into substances or they ran away from it like Veronica Lake or they became crazy. A lot of them didn't know it would be like that. And Hollywood was still fresh. That's why it was called the golden age of Hollywood, like the 40s and 50s to where now we know Hollywood for what it is, but back then it was still a new thing, you know? So the culture was just establishing itself. There wasn't like prior articles, exposés and stuff to warn people really to not get into it. So consider that <laughs> in your comments before you just rip her to shreds and leave some flowers for her because she never got an Oscar, never really got that big role that she wanted, but she really does deserve her flowers. Um, she's a beautiful person. So if you watch her interviews, a very intelligent woman also, and she deserves her flowers. Now let's do the beauty segment real quick so we can wrap this up. So back in the day, Deborah was under contract with the same movie studio as the legendary Marilyn Monroe, which I did a video for also. And can you imagine the pressure? Because Marilyn was hot. You know, she was Marilyn. Come on, you know. To stand out, Deborah knew she needed to do something extra. So she developed her own beauty secrets from hair and fashion to skincare and makeup. She had it all figured out. And so let's dive into some of these secrets she shared with Lydia Lane. I love Lydia Lane. She had all the tea on the beauty stuff. I it's just so I want to do a video on Lydia Lane so badly. But she has probably one photo out there. <laughs> and not much information on her private life at all. She just used to get all the beauty tips from people. So I'm really sad about that. It's just, you can search high and low. There's no books or anything like that you can find on her. But back in the 50s, she did interviews with Deborah. And when it came to her hair, Deborah was all about getting the color just right. She said, and I quote, there are several basic important things to learn if you want to do a good job on your hair. First, you must know what dye shades to blend for the exact color you want. And according to her, you need strong light to see the roots of your hair properly and avoid overlapping the color onto the already treated hair. Deborah loved changing her hair color often, reflecting her moodiness. She said she was a moody person, but she also took good care of her hair. She revealed every four days, I gave myself a hot oil treatment. She truly believed that the color of your hair affects your personality and mood. However, flashy platinum was a no-go for her. <laughs> She'll try anything except the flashy platinum. The transition from a teenager to a sophisticated adult is a subtle but significant. Deborah couldn't pinpoint the exact moment when this change happened, but she believed that every teenage girl reaches a point where she outgrows her youthful wardrobe. She felt an inner sophistication creeping in on her, and fashion was in Deborah's primary interest. She cared more about her individual style. Her mantra was simple. If it doesn't do anything for me, I don't wear it. She liked to keep things simple for everyday wear and save dramatic clothes for special occasions like the red carpets or galas and parties. And being a public figure, she felt it was her duty to always be well-groomed. But she also believed that every woman should take some degree of care in their appearance. Like many of us, Deborah had to keep an eye on her weight. She revealed, whenever I got a few pounds over the line, I have a wonderful diet that takes care of it, which was paleo, mostly just eating nothing processed or anything like that. My doctor gave it to me and I can drop two pounds a day with it. But dieting was tough, especially with her mom being a fantastic cook. Sitting with a skinny lamb chop while her mom enjoyed a plate of spaghetti was a real challenge. Deborah admitted, and I quote, I have gone through some terrible years struggling to keep my weight down. It is no fun for anybody. But when your career depends on dieting, this can really become a problem because the studios had no issues telling her that she was getting fat. <laughs> they would just tell her straight up and like, hey, go on a diet. She preferred to maintain her weight around 102 pounds, especially when she was dancing or doing a show. And she's pretty short. It's like five, one or two. But when she wasn't working, she found it difficult to resist the call of the refrigerator. Her advice to those fighting the same battle, keep busy. She believed that heading to the fridge could be caused by boredom just as much as having a problem. So pick up a good book or find a hobby, anything to keep your mind off of food. And most importantly, discipline yourself to eat healthy foods. As Deborah put it, the best advice that was ever given to me was keep busy. And that's something we all can apply.
okay i love this so much all of her advice she's just so beautiful leave flower emojis in the comments for her and comment below who else would you guys like a video from if you like the music you're listening to the link is in the description thank you for tuning in thumbs up until next time i love you guys bye